Okay, after that, we've got two new rules now. Um, and these are rules, these are called the product and quotient rules. Where did my rules go? Um, yeah. uh, we've got a rule about sums and differences, right? In fact, we just looked at it. Uh, if I um, add two functions together and I want to take the derivative, then all I've got to do is take the derivative of each function separately and then add them back together. Turns out that sums, uh, products and quotients don't work that way. It would be really nice if they did. It would make our job a lot simpler. But unfortunately, uh, that's not a valid rule. And so uh, now we're going to introduce exactly how to treat products of functions instead of sums or differences and, or constant multiples. So I'm starting with two functions, f and g, that are both differentiable themselves. And I'm going to multiply them together. So here's the product of f and g. What will the derivative be after the product's been taken? Well, here's the breakdown. Please notice what this says. Uh, number one, I take the derivative. This is two terms. This is a sum problem. I'm going to add these two things together. I take the first term. Uh, the first term is the derivative of the first function multiplied by the second. So I've taken the derivative of f. I leave you alone. I multiply those things together. And then I alternate in the other direction. I take f and multiply it by the derivative of g. Those two things are then added together. It's very different from the way sums and differences are taken. Make sure you understand what is not the case. You cannot do this. You can't just take the two, the two derivatives and multiply them together in the same way that you can take the two sums and multiply them together. Can't do it. You've got to go through this whole routine. First function's derivative times the second second function's derivative times the first, and then add them together. Now, because this is addition, the order doesn't really matter. So I could uh, reverse the terms here, and it'll still stay the same. Um, but there's the setup. There's the formula that defines how products can be done. Um, so let's look at this uh, in two ways. Um, here's a function that's being expressed as a product of two separate functions. My function y is equal to the product of x squared plus 7 multiplied by 2x minus 3. And each of these factors can be looked at as separate functions. So we might consider the factor x squared plus 7. We might consider that to be the function f of x. And we might consider the function 2x minus 3 to be the function g of x. And the function y is the product of those two functions. So, what's the derivative? Um, well, this, in this case, and this won't always be the case, but in this case, this is simple enough that I can actually multiply this out, and I really don't need the product rule. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to do it both ways. I'm going to go ahead and expand this, go ahead and take the derivative in the normal way, then I'll come back and apply the product rule and see if I get the same thing. Should, since it's the same function. So what do I get if I fold this out? Um, uh, the first terms, x squared times 2x. Uh, outside terms, x squared times negative 3. Inside terms, 7 times 2x. And the last term, 7 times negative 3. So there. All I did was pull that out. Now, I don't need a product rule. I've got four terms. I can do the derivative term by term. So what do I get? Derivative of 2x cubed. 6x squared. What do I get here in the middle? x here 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 okay that was easy enough it wasn't very difficult to multiply that out and once I had the expanded form I could use the sum rule and do it term by term put everything back together okay uh, but again we're not always going to have this opportunity so let's go ahead and show that according to the product rule we get the same thing, and in particular, at the same time, we'll be 
will be a verifying fact that you just can't take the two derivatives separately and multiply them together and think you're going to get the same thing. Um, so I've taken this apart in the following way. I've defined the function f to be the square function. And I've defined the function g to be the linear function. What are the derivatives of the two factors? What's the derivative of f? x. What's the derivative of g? T. Okay? So what is the derivative of y? Well, according to the formula, the derivative of y can be found by taking the derivative of f and multiplying it by g, and then taking the uh, uh, function f itself and multiplying it by the derivative of g. So there's the setup. There's f prime, there's g, there's f, there's g prime. Um, is this going to be equal to the same thing that I got in the previous case? Well, let's check. So I'll distribute here. So there's that first product. In the second place, I distribute again. So there's that second product. And then I've got uh, two like terms that I can combine. So the square powers can come together. And then the minus 6x plus 7. Oh, wait. Uh, you can catch that. It's 14. 2 times 7, right? Yep, same. Same in both cases. So it didn't matter. Uh, but please, what would have noticed what would have happened if I had just multiplied f prime and g prime? f prime of x times g prime of x, uh, that's just 4x. It's not even close. Not even close to being the proper derivative. So don't do that. So there it is. There's product rule. Um, in this case, we didn't really need it because this function was easy enough to expand out that uh, I could take the derivative without it. Um, but a um, problem like this one, problem like in part two, uh, this will be a little bit more difficult because now I've got a trinomial times a binomial. That's much more difficult to expand. Uh, not that hard, but let's go ahead and show that we don't need it. Let's go ahead and use the product rule directly, not worry about expanding that out and see what we get. So once again, these factors can be broken down into separate functions. This function here, I'm going to call f of x. The second factor should be my g of x. What are the derivatives of the two functions separately, of the two factor functions? f prime is what? And x squared. Anything else? Minus 2. g prime is what? 2x. OK, that's it. Uh, now I'm ready to go. According to the rule, I should be able to do this f prime times g plus f times g prime. f prime is 9x squared minus 2. g is x squared minus 4. f is all of that, 3x cubed minus 2x minus 5. And g is, g prime is 2x. So there's the uh, product law. Everything out in the open. F uh, F prime g, F g prime. Uh, and now I'll have to now I'll have to go and, and do the work. Uh, now that I've got these factors, um, I'll have to expand all this out, combine like terms, get this into its simplest form. So let's see what's going to happen now. Uh, what's that? Nine x to the fourth. Then I got two square terms, minus 36, minus 2, so that'll be minus 38x squared plus 8. So there's the expansion. Is that right? Is that right? Is that right?
Agree? Disagree? Uh, so I get minus 36 on the outside, minus 2 on the inside, so minus 38. Uh, 2x times, and, the, and then in the second position I just distribute 2x times x cubed, 2x times 2x, uh, 2x times 5. So there's that piece of it. And now I'll go through and collect like terms here and here here and here. So in the end, 15 minus 42 and then I've got two, fact, two terms left over that don't match up minus 10x plus 8. So there it is. There's still a lot of work. Uh, starting to get tedious. Um, but in the end, uh, I don't know, I don't know if that was that much simpler than actually expanding the original product of the trinomial and the binomial. Because again, it's not that hard, but there, didn't have to. Uh, I could use the smaller derivatives. I never had to deal with the, the largest product was binomial times binomial. Didn't have to worry about the higher, higher work case. Okay, so there we go. There's the product rule for um, uh, polynomial. Again, just a very simple power function. But I didn't have to didn't have to expand it out. I can do it in product form. Okay, so that's product rule. That's how we treat products. How do we treat quotients? What happens if I have a quotient of two terms or two functions and I want to apply the derivative to quotients? Um, well it's a little bit more complicated than the product rule, but it does have uh, one similarity. Uh, you can't do it component-wise. I can't take the derivative of the numerator and divide it by the derivative of the denominator. So in that sense, it's very like the product rule. It's not as simple as the addition rule. And, uh, but this does give me a quotient. The numerator of the quotient should look very familiar. The numerator is exactly the same form as the product rule with the exception of addition has been replaced with subtraction. But in the denominator, I get the square of the original denominator. Um, and now there is a direction to this. In the case of the product rule, the exact order that I do the factors doesn't matter. But now that I've got subtraction, it does matter. The numerator's got to have the derivative of the numerator first and then multiply that by the denominator. And in back, it's the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. So you've got to keep the order straight for the uh, quotient rule. It's identical, but subtraction instead of addition. And the quotient rule adds the denominator square power of the original. Okay, so once again, uh, and this is, a, this is probably an even more powerful rule than the product rule, although we're going to see a lot of context in which the product rule does become uh, an important tool. But let's go ahead and do the same thing. Let's go ahead and show, for example, here's a quotient. Here's two separate functions being expressed in quotient form. Uh, I might consider this numerator to be my function f of x, and I might take that denominator to be the expression g of x. Um, but let's go ahead and show that uh, this can be simplified, and then uh, we'll use the uh, simpler form to take the derivative directly, and then we'll come back and do it using the quotient rule and check to see if it made any difference which way we did it. Um, so, how do I do that? <clears throat> how do I simplify uh, this fraction form? What's the simplest form of this fraction? Or how do I take it out of fraction form? I guess that's the real question. Um, I do the usual thing. I distribute the denominator across each term in the numerator. And uh, I do get a little bit of simplifying here. Uh, this fraction here uh, does have a common factor. So in the end, uh, this simplifies to this. And this derivative should be pretty easy. What's the derivative of this function? 
1 minus, well, wait a minute, this itself, right, this factor here, that itself is x to the negative 1, but what's its derivative? So the derivative of x is 1, then I'm subtracting the derivative of the reciprocal, the negative 1 power gives me this. And uh, uh, the two negatives cancel. And I'll go ahead and put this back into the original fraction form, 1 over x squared. All right, we'll come back to this in a minute and see what we can see. Uh, now let's go ahead and apply quotient rule. So I've already identified my two functions, f of x, I'm going to let be the numerator function, x squared plus 1, g of x, I'm going to let that be the denominator, just plain 1. Uh, the derivative of f is what? 2x. Oh, the derivative of g is not 1, g is x. And the derivative of g is what? 1. Okay, now let's put this together. According to the rule, f prime, which is 2x, multiplied by the function g. So there's f prime in front, g in back. From that I'm going to subtract the function f, x squared plus 1, multiplied by g prime, g prime, which is 1 itself. So there's that same arrangement as before, but addition being replaced with subtraction. And then the denominator, I take whatever the denominator was originally and I square it. So the original denominator x and then squared. And now I've got a little work to do. Let's see, what does this end up being? Uh, 2x squared minus x squared minus 1, distributing the negative sign. And then finally, I've got a pair of like terms here. Uh, the x squared, uh, 2x squared minus x squared. Is that the same thing I got before? These two things equal? Yeah. I can verify that just by doing the exact same thing. Uh, distribute the denominator here. And this first term is equal to 1. So I'm dividing the same thing by itself. So 1 minus 1 over x squared. Yep, or same thing. Uh, so in some cases, that's the possibility. Uh, if in particular, if the denominator is a monomial, single term, quite frequently, we can simplify those independently and not have to worry about application of the product of the quotient rule. Quotient rule is a little complicated, so if I can't avoid it, I would like to. Uh, in this case, I could, rather simply, but it didn't matter. Same thing anyway. Um, but there will be some context in which that's not going to be possible. Uh, for example, uh, this expression. Um, now, I don't have the option of simplifying in advance. Uh, this fraction is already in simplest form. There's no common factor. So I'll have to treat this as a quotient rule problem. There's no way around it. So once again, I'm going to look at each part of this fraction as a separate function. The numerator, I'm going to call that function f of x. And the denominator, got the function g of x. Okay, so there's my two functions. In order to compute the quotient uh, through the rule, I'm going to need to um, find the derivatives. If I'm going to separate in this way, what's the derivative of f? 3. And the derivative of g? 2. Okay, that's all I need. Now I'm ready to go. And again, I'll remind you exactly what we're about to do here. Um, I'm going to take, <coughs> I'm going to start with f's derivative multiplied by the function g. So 
derivative of the numerator multiplied by the function in the denominator. And then I'll reverse it in the second position, the function from the numerator multiplied by the derivative of the function in the denominator. Like that. And all of this over the square of the original denominator. Okay, so there's that part of it. <coughs> and now all the work, the rest of it is just going to be simplifying. 6x minus 12 for the first pair, and then minus uh, 6x plus 2 for the second pair. And then when I subtract, uh, I've still got to uh, distribute, so minus 6x minus 12, and then cancel here, cancel here. So the x's cancel away, minus 12, minus 12 is all I have left. So minus 24 in the numerator, and please notice that I never really did anything with that denominator, didn't really enter into that process in any way. In the end, um, I just left it alone. And don't worry about expanding that out. Right? Whenever you've got a quotient rule problem, we normally leave the denominator in square form. Don't worry about expanding that. Uh, in particular, if we have to do some kind of simplifying here, then did I do something wrong? Shouldn't that be minus 2 instead of minus 12 on the right side? Ah, yep. That is exactly correct. That should not be minus 12. It's supposed to be minus 2. So what should this be? 14. Okay. Is that better? Okay. So there's a... And again, this is an instance in which you really didn't have any choice. Unlike the, the two examples that we looked at that involved the product rule. You didn't have any choice here about how to take that derivative. Um, Okay, there's, again, there's something else. I don't have it here, but there's something else I want now. Uh, let me. Um, what I want now is the second derivative. Okay? Here's the first derivative. What I want now is the second derivative. What is that going to equal? So now we're going to go through this again. But we're looking at a completely different function form. Now, instead of having uh, the uh, uh, two variable functions, now one of my functions is going to be constant. But now we're going to run through this again, and now I'm going to give my two functions new names, or my, new, my old functions new forms. Uh, so in order to take this a step further, now I need the derivatives of these two things. Uh, so I'm calling f of x 14. In fact, let me go ahead and... Uh, so here I'm about to do the second derivative. Um, f of x is going to be 14. What's the derivative of f? Zero. Okay, that's good. That's going to make things very. That's going to at least uh, make things. Uh, one of my one of my terms is going to vanish. Uh, g of x is the square What's the derivative of g? I don't think so. <coughs> well, here's a question. Uh, you know, is it equal to this? Is g prime what I get when I take the 2 out front Is that g prime? Of course not, right? It's a power not of the variable, but of a variable expression. In order to compute now next week, is yes, it next week? Yeah, next week. Next week we're going to run the rule that tells us how to do this without having to expand. But at this point, uh, we can't really finish this without expanding the square power. Turns out that, of course, I can't do this.
I can't just take the power out front like I would normally if it were just x squared. If it's anything more complicated than the square of the variable, then I have to expand it out and then take the derivative. So here's an example of a problem in which the expansion is going to be required. Uh, square power is the binomial. I have to compute this through the FOIL method. So what's the simplest form of g? 4x squared, that goes in front. What do I get in the middle? So I get minus 8x in both, since I'm repeating, minus 8x in both sides, so minus 16x, and then the two negative 4s. So um, that's the function g. And so what is g's derivative equal to? 8x minus 16. Okay, so be careful about that. Uh, if you've got the square of a variable expression, that's very different from the square of the variable. The variable's simple variable, x squared, that's one of our power rules, but if it's anything more complicated, I've got to expand things out and look at it as a square power instead of as, a, 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 as an expanded polynomial form as opposed to a square power. Okay, but there we go. That's all I need now. Now I can take the second derivative. Uh, the second derivative now uh, comes from the same formula. The derivative of f, <coughs> which just happens to be zero, so it really doesn't matter what g is because that term's going to vanish, but g was this. And, oh, and by the way, uh, what about that negative sitting in front? just going to sit there. That's a constant multiple. So the constant multiplier, if we look at the negative as a constant multiplier, doesn't enter into the process. So I have to leave that there. That'll still be there when I'm finished. Um, and then the thing, uh, the multiple, uh, uh, the derivative of f multiplied by the function g. And then from I subtract the function f itself multiplied by g's derivative. And all of this will go over the square of the original denominator. That denominator was already a square power itself, and now I'm applying the square power for a second time. And now what's going to happen? Number one, this term here is going to vanish. The zero multiplier squashes that out. And then what? Um, negative 14 times 8 is what? 112. So I've got, still got the minus out front. That's minus 112x, and then 14 times 16 is what? 224 plus 224. And what's the new power of the denominator going to be? To the fourth. So the square power, the square applied to the square, that's the multiplication rule, 2 times 2. Okay, and finally, uh, I'll, here's the result. Here's the end result of the, all the operations being applied in the proper order. Um, but I'm going to do a couple of things here. Uh, very common uh, simplification rules. Number one, I don't like the leading negative in that numerator. We we don't lead with negatives if we can avoid it. And it just so happens I've got a negative out front that I can use to cancel that away. So the first step would be to apply that negative to the numerator. Anytime I've got a negative in front of the fraction, I can apply it to either bottom or top separately. I'm going to go ahead and apply that to the top. And that will take care of that leading negative. And in addition, I've got a common factor up there in the numerator. Uh, what's the common factor between the two numerator terms? There's, yeah, 112. 112 is a common factor. Uh, so on the one hand, the negative here is going to change all of this. The negative in front now is, so there goes that leading negative. It's shifted to the back term. And that factor of 112 can be taken out. So 112 is the common factor. X minus 2 is the left, is remainder. Oh, gee whiz. No, I can go even further, right? Yeah, no, this is a, what should I do here now?
Yeah, maybe I went. Maybe I was going a little bit too fast. So let's go back to where we were. 112. Uh, no, 112x minus 224. Uh, I was just looking at the numerator to try and find a common factor, but now I can see there's probably, uh, especially considering this is a fraction form, should have been looking at the common factor between the numerator and the denominator. And by the way, it's fourth power. What's the common factor between the two parts of the fraction? In fact, I couldn't, you know. <coughs> yeah, it's not 56, not the common factor, but if I don't factor it completely, if I just take that 56 out, what do I see? Well, you know, when it was x minus 2, that was a tip off. In fact, this is a very common result from this. Anytime that you apply multiple applications to a common. Um, uh, a common uh, quotient rule problem, uh, the power of the denominator usually, uh, normally only goes up by one. So I start with the square power. Now I can see that what I really have here is a common factor between those two forms. So this numerator has one factor of 2x minus 4, and the denominator has four of them, so I can cancel there. Now, the new result will have be one, and this is what we expect when we take uh, derivatives of these reciprocal forms. We expect them to go up one power at a time. And so watch out for this. I was going a little bit too fast. When I factored out the entire 112, I missed that common factor that really puts this in a much simpler form. So in the end, all that remains uh, is the 56 that I factored away, and then the third power of the denominator, which is again exactly the way that we normally see reciprocal forms behave. They normally increase by one power per derivative. So the second power from the first term, started with the first power of that denominator, then the second, now the third. So there's the uh, higher order derivative being applied by double applications of the quotient rule. But the trick here, so on the one hand, there's the formula itself, understanding how to fit it together, understanding when to apply it. But the more difficult part of the quotient rule is this simplification, making sure that you can get the form into its simplest possible form. And that means any common factor between the two parts of the fraction, those are, that's the overriding concern. Is there a common factor between the numerator and the denominator? That's what I'm really looking for. And um, as we, as we uh, apply this repeatedly, we're normally going to be able to find that. And we found it here. Um, all right. Um, I don't want to start the new thing now, so we'll just stop there. So uh, we introduced, so we've got, uh, what do we got now? Six rules, six differentiation laws. We've got the constant rule, the two linear properties, power rule, product rule, quotient rule. Um, next time, we'll start trigonometric functions and look at their derivatives, and that'll be the cutoff point for this week. Okay. And I'll have the test next time. I'll bring the test back next time, I hope. So have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you next time.